Rita, but I would like to welcome all the Malta family, and we have a few more distinguished guests that joined us for this great Zoom meeting. We, it's uh, the second one. We had two weeks ago our first Zoom meeting that got a lot of publicity around the world. Uh, almost in every country that we can find, we could find an article that was printed there. So we are very happy with that. And we are happy that Dr. Victor Zhao agreed in his busy schedule to be our speaker uh, for this Zoom meeting. I would like to thank uh, our board meeting, uh, our board member Omar Farah for all these arrangements and making sure that everything works well. Omar will explain to you in a few minutes how we will run the question and answers. Uh, I would like to thank our board member, Hong Keller, that uh, arranged the speaker, arranged all the two Zooms uh, meeting. Just a few words about Hong, to people that don't know who he is. Hong serves as executive chairman of Kinnap Foundation, a global partnership in innovation, promoting research-based innovation for public and societal benefit. So, I will now turn to Omar to explain how we will deal with the question and answers. Uh, thank you, Zafra. Uh, but also let me uh, extend uh, my welcome to all of you, the Malta family, uh, to the Malta Conferences Foundation virtual lecture series. My name is Omar Farhan. I am one of the board members of Malta professor at Northwestern University and president of NUMAT Technologies. Uh, also, I would love to uh, and thank uh, our distinguished speaker for being with us here, as Zafra said, uh, in this crazy times with his most likely crazy schedule. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I am the MC of this virtual meeting. Give you a couple uh, tips here. If you are not speaking, please turn off your video and mute your sound. Regarding the Q&A uh, period, please type in your questions in the Q&A tab found at the bottom of the screen. Zafra said, I did uh, a lot of things. I actually did not do anything. My team here, led by Nick at Northwestern University, is the ones behind the scene, uh, planned everything. So thank you, Nick, to you and your team. Uh, with that, uh, uh, Zafra. Uh, okay, so we'll now turn to Hong to introduce our distinguished speaker. Yeah, thank you very much, Safra. Thank you very much, Omar. It is a true honor and privilege to know Victor. Um, Victor is not only one of the most distinguished scientists I have met, he is a person who taught me what science diplomacy means. And that actually means to bring science to the understanding of politicians and to the benefit of people. And to do that in environments uh, that often don't necessarily trust in exact, sharp, conclusive and forward-looking statements. So um, Victor um, has had a distinguished career um, at Stanford and at Harvard as chair of medicine. He is today um, the president of the National Academy of Medicine in the United States. Um, but um, for our goal here, even more so, he is the global leader on all platforms from Davos to the European Union um, towards Southeast Asia and behind a thoughtful and a considerate inclusive pathway for tackling the most substantive human health issues we have, including COVID. Victor, it will be a big honor for all of us to learn from you. You've titled your talk, A World in Disorder, 
And knowing you at the end, there will be a principle on how to get it back into order. So we are all very carefully and interested listening. Thank you very, very much uh, for taking the time. The stage is yours. Thank you very much, my dear friend Holm. It's a great honor to speak to the group in Malta and of course, Dr. Lerman and Dr. Farrar and others, but all the distinguished guests. And Holm, working with you has been also extremely inspiring. What you've been able to do with Kenop Foundation, with EU and also globally, you and I have been involved with a number of important projects and I look forward to working with you some more in the future. So the topic I'm asked to speak about is uh, where are we in COVID? And I thought what I would do is begin by telling you about the report of the Global Preparedness Monitoring Board and then begin to talk about what people are doing and what needs to be done going forward. Can I have the next slide, please? So, who is GPMB? Well, we're independent. We're monitoring accountable body to ensure preparedness for global health crisis. We're formed in response to the recommendation of UN Secretary General's Global Health Crisis Task Force, which was formed after Ebola in 2017. GPMB was co-convened by the World Economic for pardon me, the World Health Organization and World Bank and launched in 2018. It comprised its co-chaired by Gro Brundlin, who used to be Norwegian Prime Minister and Director General of WHO, as well as C, uh, who is in fact the former head of the International Federation of Red Cross. There are many others who are Ministers of Health from different countries and also independents like myself, uh, Jeremy Farrar from Welcome Trust, Chris Elias from Gates Foundation and many others. Our job is to look at a comprehensive and independent appraisal for policymakers about what progress has been made during pandemic and what's prepared in terms of ready for pandemic and then with important advice. So in 2019, we released a report called The World at Risk. And may I have next slide, please? And in this report, we pointed out that uh, we actually issued a stern warning of the dangers posed by a respiratory pathogen that can become a pandemic. And that could kill millions of people and wipe out a big percent of the economy. And we warned that the world was ill-prepared for such a pandemic. Well, sadly to say, we're now seeing it happening in front of our eyes. In this report, we call for seven urgent actions. Uh, one, heads of government to commit and invest. Second, all countries to build strong systems and to be prepared. Third is development assistance funders to increase funding for preparedness. And then the UN nations to strengthen coordination mechanism. As you all know, the progress was not great since last year. And after the Ebola, there's been insufficient uh, investment, financial or politically. And of course, we're all paying the price. Can I the next slide, please? Tragically, we've seen our worst fears realized. And as you can see in this particular slide, the um, current status of the pandemic. We are now experiencing 38 million cases in the world and 1 million deaths. And of course, the United States, where I live, where I work, we're not doing very well at all, along with India and Brazil and many others. And even in the last 24 hours, there's 260,000 new cases and almost 4,000 deaths. This is a significant problem. And of course, this is not only a health crisis, but in fact is a crisis of economy, of human well-being, of education, you name it. Next slide. This slide shows you the case I'm making. In other words, if you look at this diagram, it shows that pandemic is well beyond health. 
it poses an existential threat to societies and development as a whole, threatening to undermine all the sustainable development goals. Decades of global public health progress and jeopardy, children not getting vaccinated in many countries and people not getting care. Trillions of dollars lost in the economy. 1.6 billion students out of school at the peak of pandemic. And of course, there's increased poverty with 135 million people falling behind the poverty threshold for 2030 of the UN goals. So you can imagine how important this issue is and how devastating issue is. Many of us have friends who are affected by it. Many of us know someone who died from it. And of course, I think that everybody, the world has pretty much stopped until we can put this pandemic uh, to a halt. Next slide. So what I want to do is spend time asking the questions. What are the lessons learned? I think what we can say is there's massive failure and then changes that are urgently needed. First, COVID-19 pandemic has revealed a collective failure to take prevention, preparedness response seriously and prioritize it accordingly. It's demonstrated the fragility of highly interconnected economies and social systems and the fragility of trust. It has exploited in inequalities. Certainly the poor countries and our country, the people who are more social economic disadvantaged I suffer a lot more greatly. And there's no health security without social security. COVID-19 has taken advantage of the world in disorder. That is the name of our report. We've learned that a world where a shock anywhere can become catastrophe everywhere. Infectious disease feed off divisiveness in, in society and social divisions can be deadly. You know, this pandemic has a huge human dimension the dimension of preparedness, because if you look at the human side of things, responsible leaders matter and citizens play a critical role. First, the lack of accountability by many leaders have led to a deepening of deficit and trust that's dampening the efforts to stop this pandemic. You know, leadership makes a difference. Effective leaders need to act decisively based on science and must not polarize and politicize this pandemic. But it's not only what the government do, it's what people must do to protect each other. So citizens matter. They must understand that their role is to protect not only themselves, but all the others. Communities matter. We also learned that current measures of pandemic are not predictive. And in fact, some of the best country prepared countries, according to the use of Global Health Security Index, the JEE and others, which are usually measured in all the countries as the index of preparedness, are not predictive of what's happened when pandemic outbreaks. Take the United States. We rank number one in Global Health Security Index, but we are actually performing one of the worst. So that's why I say, Leadership matters, citizenship matters, and what we do matters at the time of pandemic. Health emergency preparedness required effective agile systems. And I'll talk a little bit more about this, but these systems must be in place for prevention, detection, response, and recovery. With flexibility and scalability to cope with a variety of emergency. And it requires a whole of government and whole of society approach. You know, pandemic preparedness is a common good. It's just not for yourself, for your country, but in fact, it's the interest of everyone. So while we recognize the responsibility of national leaders to act in the interest of their own countries, successful prevention, detection, response benefits people everywhere. Consequently, it's wholly dependent on each other and is responsible of all countries. Finally, we need to invest. The return investment in global security is immense. To date, 40, 14 trillion GDP dollars have been lost due to COVID. And over in US, 11 trillion has been spent to fund the response, the relief and stimulus bills. And we expect a lot more loss going forward. 
So by investing in preparedness and investing in vaccine treatment and diagnostic, it's a small fraction, as I talk about, of the total economic loss. So we should invest. And finally, no one is safe until everybody's safe. Global preparedness is not simply the sum of national preparedness. It's collective global action, a multilateral system to support that action. Such a system requires solidarity and of course, no further fragmentation. So I'm gonna talk a little bit more at this point about our specific recommendations, which of course evolve a lot, a lot around the lessons learned. Next slide. So this is the architecture to date of global preparedness. As you can see, it's very complex and it's impossible to navigate. So obviously, governance, structure, support are absolutely important in going forward. Next slide. So in our report, we say five things matter. Responsible leadership, engaged citizenship, strong and agile systems for health security, a robust governance of preparedness, and sustained investment. And I'll talk briefly about each one of them. Next slide. So what do we need to do? What do we need global leaders to do? First, we say you must have responsible leadership, that national leaders and leaders of international organization and other stakeholders must take early decisive action based on science, evidence, and best practice. And of course, we've seen that in some countries, in South Korea, in Japan, in Singapore, and many countries who take an early decisive action based on good public health measures, they have controlled the case very well, but whereas in other countries whose decisions are delayed, including the United States, and of course, issue being politicized, we're seeing still continual problem. The second, of course, is to discourage politicization and ensure social protection. This involves a social system that helps each other, but also a national unity and global solidarity system. We say that each government must appoint a high level coordinator with the authority and accountability to lead the whole of government and whole of society approach and not fragmented between health, economy, and many others. And of course, we talked about the need for leaders along with manufacturers and international organizations to be sure that the countermeasures such as diagnostic therapeutics, PPE and vaccines are allocated in a way that is fair, equitable everywhere so that everyone in the world have access to. Next slide. Second point, I already made this point, engage citizenship. The citizens like, like you, me and all of us must demand accountability from our government for preparedness and require the government to empower the citizens and strengthen civil society. And that each one of us must take responsibility to seek and use accurate information, educate ourselves, our family and communities, and practice to protect ourselves and protect each other. Most important, protect the most vulnerable. Next slide. Third is, agile, strong government and national systems for global health security. That means, as I said, all of society approach. And every heads of government must strengthen the national system with a one health approach looking at animal and human, but build public health capacities and workforce for surveillance, early detection, sharing information, and strengthen the system with surge capacity, and importantly, social protection is safeguard the vulnerable. We see that in our country very much, that communities of color, the communities of poverty are most vulnerable and deaths are occurring mainly in those communities. We also argue that research, institutions, funders, private sector, governments, WHO and other organizations must improve the coordination and support for research and development. And this mechanism has to assure whatever we do that's equitable access to everyone for vaccines, diagnostics, therapeutics, and of course, other interventions. 
So multilateralism is really important. Although I can understand why each country's leadership needs to protect the citizen, but it also has to understand that if you don't protect and work with others, then you'll always be vulnerable for infections that in fact are transported. And of course, also the great sense of solidarity to help each other. And we have to strengthen WHO as an independent international organization. Next slide. So that means investment in prevention and preparedness. Currently, we don't have too many mechanisms as mainly dependent on donor assistance. So the rich country help the poor countries. People give money to WHO. We must think about a much better mechanism that everybody participates so that you don't have to go hat in hand to ask for money when you really need it. So G20 leaders, heads of government, UN, WHO, international finance institutions like the World Bank and uh, IMF and others must come together to create a sustainable, stable investment and not ups and downs in terms of need during pandemic. Next slide. And finally, it's important to have a governance structure that works. First, a governance to look at preparedness. The international health regulation is an agreement among all the member states to say they will, they will meet the goals of preparedness. We need to be sure this is implemented and accountable. That the leaders with WHO United Nations must develop multi-sectoral preparedness and that there should be a world summit, UN or otherwise, to look at a framework for preparedness and response for the future. Next slide. So with that background, I think you agree with me, there's a lot of work to be done, but there's a lot of lessons learned. The principal lesson I learned is how important leadership is, how important every one of us is, that we all need to take responsibility and how we must come together with universal solidarity. So this leads me to talk about what you do so much in science, in medical care, political arena, or just being a good citizen. Because if you look at the slide, it talks about when you have COVID-19, how do we actually respond to this? Well, on one hand, if you look at the left-hand side, you of course have mild symptomatic disease, and then you have severe disease. The severe disease will require hospitalization, and of course, tremendous amount of resources to treat them. That means that you have to have a strengthened health system with capacity, with PPE, oxygen, and others to protect the healthcare workers as well, and to prevent transmission. But importantly, if you look at overall what's needed are diagnostics, vaccines, and therapeutics, because these are the ones that be used to detect, to survey, to be able to treat, and to be able to prevent it all together. And overall, as you can see in the left-hand slide, we need to think about how to access and allocate these kind of important countermeasures. Next slide. Now, I know public health is really important and non-pharmaceutical interventions such as facial covering, mask, social distancing, washing your hands are important. This slide shows you that it works However, it's very difficult to sustain. Over the summer months, you can see that the countries shown over on the left-hand side, the adoption of NPI is dropping. And we're seeing on the right-hand side, the continued rise of the cases. So therefore, we must work very hard to look at treatment, diagnostics, and vaccine. Next slide. So I want to tell you what's happened globally. There are three important events that's now put us in a good position to go forward with stopping this pandemic. One is GPMB on March called for 8 billion US dollars to fund vaccines, drugs, and diagnostics. I and Jeremy Farrar were the two who led this effort. Second is in response to our effort, the European Commission led by President von der Leyen hosted a current coronavirus global response pledging event internationally. And actually at the end, we raised $17.9 billion. And third is the creation of a COVID tools accelerator 
which was formed about the same time, and that has allowed people to come together globally to coordinate its effect and response. Next slide. So first, this event, which happened May 4th, was led by President von der Leyen with the participation of 30 heads of state and many leaders. And, you know, she was bold because when I called her personally, she says, yes, I can help. And I can bring people together to raise the money. And that initiated lots of people coming together to think about how to solve this problem. Next slide. And because of the pledge and because of other reasons, the WHO, Macron in France, European Commission, and many others came together to say we must unite to access vaccine, diagnostic, and treatment. And the creation of ACT, ACT Accelerator was launched in late April. Next slide. ACT Accelerator is now a global initiative. It has three pillars. That is vaccine, therapeutics, and diagnostics with across the bottom health system. So there are four different areas it's working on collectively. And it's looking from end to end on each pillar. That is from research development to manufacturing, to procurement, to distribution allocation. It's overseen by the accelerator principal, the steering group, which I serve, and a coordination hub, which is organized by WHO. And it's overseen by a council of G20 countries, including Saudi Arabia and WHO, uh, and also uh, and many other uh, entities. Next slide. But I want to tell you what's unique about this, because when you look at the global entities of CEPI, the Vaccine Preparedness Innovation Entity, Gavi, the purchasers, procurement vaccine for poor countries, WHO, the normative organization for the world, Global Fund, the fund that actually treats people with malaria, TB, and, uh, and HIV, the World Bank, the UNITAID. This is the first time everybody's coming together, playing their role in vaccines, therapeutics, health systems, diagnostic, and access allocation. This engagement is unheard of because these are independent organizations that may collaborate, but they're willing to put their time to come under one roof. Next slide. And importantly, the vaccine uh, pillar is called COVAX and has brought together Gavi, CEPI, and WHO. So it's end to end from R&D to manufacturing, to procurement, to policy allocation, and to bring everybody in agreement with industry. So what's unique about this pillar is it brings the CEPI's push side, that is investment for R&D at risk and manufacturing, to Gavi's procurement for the poor countries, advanced market commitments, to assure there's enough doses for everyone, and is supported by WHO, which look at regulation and allocation. So I want to tell you a success story. It's still very much work in progress. With this COVAX facility, we now have vaccine multilateralism. At the very beginning, United States is working, has spent over $10 billion in vaccine. And vaccine nationalism between UK, uh, Germany, Japan, China, everybody's buying their own vaccine because they're really worried about there's not enough for their country. The good news is by creation, this multilateralism, EU alliance have joined, Japan, Singapore, now even poorer countries, upper middle income countries, and even countries which are not under Gavi have all joined. We now have 194 countries with both self-financing as well as Gavi supported countries and cover two thirds world's population. This is really good news. Now there's still a lot of work to be done but countries now begin to join COVAX. US is still sitting out on its own. China has just joined COVAX two days ago. And of course, we're still looking, Russia is not part of this, but I think it shows that multilateralism is possible. And it's possible even if some countries don't join. Next slide. 
Now, so what is the goal of this ACT accelerator? On the vaccine pillar, the idea is to secure 2 billion doses by the end of 2021. We're not there yet. And of course, right now, there's no vaccine. But the agreement with companies to be sure that when it's ready, so many doses will come to ACT accelerator to be distributed is important. Second therapeutics, 245 million courses by end of 2021, and diagnostic 500 million tests by 2021. And of course, in the health system, we want oxygen PPE to be available for those countries that need it. Next slide. So great progress. As you remember, I said it was founded at the end of April, beginning of May. In this last five, six months, we have made tremendous progress. We have now 200 candidates being followed by the vaccine pillar, 10 vaccine candidates in portfolio, and of course, many of them are in clinical trials. And as I told you that the COVAX has many countries engaged. In therapeutics, there's about 1,700 clinical trials which we follow, and over 200 actionable readouts with priority assets under monitoring, but 15 country clinical trials are being funded by this ACT accelerator. And of course, dexamethasone, the first life-saving therapy approved, came out from one of the trials we support. In diagnostics, again, there's many active efforts. And as you might have read, we just approved and procured a rapid antigen diagnostic test for globally, which was approved by WHO. And of course, many other activities. Next slide. I think what's unique about this is that instead of doing R&D manufacturing procurement delivery individually, it's actually working together and in parallel. So the whole idea is to end the acute phase of a pandemic. Next slide. So Act Accelerator to date is unprecedented. To me, it's the only mechanism designed to simultaneously to end pandemic everywhere and of course, return to health, return to the economy, improve trade, and uh, probably have everybody return to our previous conditions, if not better. Next slide. But we have lots of challenges. One, even though we raised a lot of money, there's not enough money to do the 200 billion doses. So there needs to be a step in increase in financing. Second, of course, with so many vaccines coming and available, we have to coordinate the rollout of the vaccines. Initially scarce, and then later on, more. So distribution of the countermeasures is important, and of course, ensuring public trust. So the rest of my talk, I'm going to talk about these areas. Next slide. So first, you can see in the slide on the left side, the startup pledge of 17 some billion dollars only allowed three million dollars to come into accelerate because the others are already committed to their own countries. We're now with COVAX and self-funded countries, there's more dollars. But you can see our estimate back in September is that we need $35 billion more. Now maybe less, but still we're dealing with 20 or more billion dollars. And of course, if you look at the other side, the, on the right side of the, of the uh, slide, you can see that to coordinate the role of vaccines, if you can see globally on the last column, there's about 2,000, you know, potential doses, about well, 2 million, I mean, 2 billion, that's need to be rolled out. So a lot of work to be coordinated. Next slide. Now, so financing. Today, I won't have time to talk about this, but I do want to point out one important factor this slide shows. The world has actually put in about 10, 11 trillion dollars shown on the left slide, side of the slide. US have put in almost 3 trillion and other countries. Now, if you imagine the amount of money put into that, the reason is to stimulate the economy. This is learned from the 2018 economic disaster. But what they haven't learned is, of course, COVID is a health issue 
and investing not only in the economy, but also in health. Because by investing in health, you can actually don't have to invest that much in recovery economy. So we're arguing that a small fraction of 10 trillion, 30 billion dollars, can be used to stop the economy. So why isn't the world realizing that we need a financing system that can actually always stop the pandemic and won't have to spend that much time in economic recovery? And the argument of pitching between health versus economy is a, is a false argument because they're interconnected together. So our country, they openly argue about opening the economy and, uh, you know, because we're suffering and yet the health people are preventing from doing this. I think this is a false argument. We need to work together. Next slide. So, as I said, we need a sustainable mechanism for global public good. Key players to develop all these tools I talked about. And I think Exercise is a good case study for a global coordinated response and sustainable structure and a good case study for financing this global public good. Next slide. Now, let's talk about vaccine trust or hesitancy. This slide shows you even if we have vaccine, we have a lot of work to do. On the left-hand side, you can see the bar graphs, the horizontal bar graphs. It says about 50% of people surveyed globally said they'll take the vaccine. 25% will say they never will, and 25% they're not sure. And we've seen the United States more and more people hesitant of taking vaccine because they don't trust the government. On the right-hand side, it shows the global response with regards to currently in terms of uh, the flu vaccine. Doctors, 92% says yes, and global population, 66%. But when it comes to COVID, you can see at the bottom, 60% physicians, lower public. Uh, so I think we are getting erosion of trust everywhere, including the healthcare providers. Next slide. So we must therefore pre gain trust. We must therefore be transparent in the decision of how to get approval, clinical trials, safety measures, and eventually, how do you distribute the vaccine? An allocation mechanism is fair to everybody. And WHO has a report that looks at the target population vaccination. And it says, look, the first tier has to be people at the greatest risk, healthcare workers, people over 65, or people with high mobility and high risk of death. And then in the next few layers, you then distribute it this way. And of course, this is the overall guidance for many countries. And then when the countries get their vaccine allocation, they have to follow, hopefully, this proposal. Next slide. In the National Academy of Medicine, we have just published a report at the request of US government as an independent advisor so that the public can trust our report because they are increasingly not trusting the government. And this is this very similar to WHO of allocation for the US population. We talk about four phases to distribute to the state, to tribal areas, American Indians, local territorial authorities, etc. We argue the use of existing program for distribution. We say there must be a campaign of engagement of the public to talk about vaccine trust and risk communication. And we, of course, have to support a fair and equitable allocation. Next slide. I don't have time to go through this slide of four phases, but our phase one is very similar to the WHO. Healthcare workers, people at the highest risk with comorbidities, the older population. You can see the goal is to maximize society benefit by reducing morbidity and mortality caused by transmission virus. And equity, as you can see, is a cross-cutting cords consideration. We must take care of the people who are most vulnerable. Next slide. So I want to conclude by saying, if you look at this diagram, global health preparedness is very complex with many dimensions, but in the center is a strong, robust governance structure. We must have strong leadership, engaged citizenship, agile system, sustainable investment, and governance essential at the core 
and we must create a sustainable governance structure. Next slide. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for listening to me. I think pandemic is providing harsh lesson, test of our world's preparedness and fragility. So unfortunately, last year, when we released a report, we say we must be prepared, but progress has been slow. Failure to learn lessons of COVID-19 and to act on them with necessary resources and commitment will mean that next pandemic, which is surely to come, will be even more damaging than what we've seen today. So let's all work hard at this. And I thank you very much for listening to my remarks. And I look forward to having a conversation with you. Thank you. Thank you so much for a wonderful talk. And it's been a privilege to listen to you, uh, putting all this hard work behind the scene to show us uh, what's been done and what will be done. And, uh, you know, this is uh, not an easy task. And uh, uh, But I'm glad somebody like you, uh, who is leading uh, such a wonderful mission. Uh, well, I'm only one of the players. I'm not the leading, but I'm glad to be involved. Uh, thank you. Uh, let me, uh, we have a few questions, but I am going to ask the first uh, question myself. So who should be the face of the vaccine uh, to really get the public buy-in and increase the acceptance all the way to the high 80s percentile? Well, I think that, first of all, everybody needs to be involved not just one individual. I think it's a multiple layers. So for example, um, the public, healthcare providers, celebrities, politicians, and most important, trusted individuals. So it's a national campaign. You know, back in the 1950s and then 1980s, there was a campaign to eradicate polio in the United States. It was a national campaign. It's not just a little bit here, a little bit there. But I would say that, for example, I'm very worried about the healthcare providers who in the United States are beginning to hesitate. And of course, they, they influence us of the patients. If doctors and nurses and others are saying, I don't know, I won't be the first to do it, I don't trust it, then of course, patients will not trust it. So we have to work on that level. But at the end of the day, it's the public. And you need public people who can be trusted. So to me, it's not only the government. It has to be leaders in the community. And in our country, we work with many leaders, particularly in the black community, where they are religious leaders, they're civic leaders. They are the ones that people trust. And I think in your countries, I'm sure you can see who the real trusted individuals are. And they must work very hard with everybody to disseminate this message. Omar. So we have a question from Daniel uh, and it says, as it looks today, the Pfizer and perhaps the Moderna vaccine will be ready to start production by the end of 2020. Uh, what is your prediction as for when everyone will be able to receive the vaccine and more specifically the Middle East region? I'm hoping that maybe the late 2021, uh, you say everyone, this is a very tricky question, right? I think that we can expect vaccines to be available in early 2021. And then the distribution to be now moving towards the population. So maybe in the second quarter, starting with phase one, phase two. So phase one, maybe the first quarter of next year, and uh, as you move into phase two, phase three, that eventually uh, most population somewhere in 2022, if you think about the globe. But in countries like Middle East, where in fact the population is smaller and you don't, as not as distributed, you may be able to achieve that much earlier. And a connected, uh, another question, but connected in a way, Will the COVID vaccine be effective if a significant portion uh, of the population is delayed in getting the vaccine? 
Yes, I think it's very important. This is why the phase approach is important. Because you look at the highest risk, not only to protect them, but they're also the ones who are likely to transmit. If you are a healthcare worker, you have a highest risk, but you're also a transmitter, potentially. If you look at the high risk in elderly population, likewise, if you can first look at the hotspots, where the highest risk. So even in the vaccine distribution, if you go through the phases, any place there's an outbreak, they should have a high priority because you can contain the transmission from that hot spot. And so I think that by this very careful phasing, you can slow the transmission substantially. So you can even contain the transmission before you get total herd immunity. Uh, our next question uh, comes from Flint Lewis. Uh, to what degree has the COVID-19 pandemic uh, impacted the public's view of science and scientists? Thank you very much, Ryan, for that question. This is a very important question for someone like me and academies. Uh, we have certainly done some studies as others to look at this issue. Number one, I think science is now, during COVID, is more visible than ever. In our country, we think about Sputnik. That, and the Sputnik, everyone in the nation was involved with the science. I think COVID likewise. But at the same time, science is also losing trust. So even though it's more visible, it's losing trust. The lack of trust has to do with very complex issue of inconsistency, the time taken and of course politicization of science. So that if you think about the vaccine, you know, I think our good leaders of FDA, CDC, NIH are working very hard to be sure that they follow very good procedures of when to do approval, et cetera. But there's constant, as you know, interference by politics, by news, by many others, which creates a lack of trust overall. So I think there's a lot of work to be done on both sides, which is improving trust in science and being able to implement the science itself. Uh, next question, uh, do the recent vaccine trial pauses concern you or is it simply to be expected? It's a very good question. We all know that uh, vaccines, you know, have possible side effects. And particularly when you look at vaccines of this nature, you can possibly augment uh, what they call enhancement uh, and, uh, you know, the immune enhancement. So it's not surprising that you may have some side effect. And the whole idea is to study a large population and to hope that most people, by far the majority gain, with some side effect. But I think it's reasonable to be cautious. So when you're doing a clinical trial, and you have a patient with transverse myelitis or any un untoward effect, you have to look, ask the question, is really the vaccine? Or is it a, simply a coincidence? And I think that certainly the AstraZeneca Oxford uh, vaccine underwent that. And now more recently, Lily and also J&J. &J. So I think it is a very important lesson but it's a good lesson that the public are worried about unsafe vaccines, that these companies and the DSMB, the Data Safety Monitoring Board, are doing their job in making sure vaccines, when they are approved, are safe. So I would say, yes, it's expected. How frequent, I don't know, but it's good practice to take a pause and then to look at whether it's related or not, and to be assured the public that the safety is the number one issue. So uh, the next question comes from uh, the UK. Say so the UK government has just announced three tier risk system for regions of the country as medium, high and very high uh, as a means of trying to avoid complete second lockdown. Do you think this is a sensible approach or should we go for uh, the shortest lockdown possible? My feeling is nothing is black and white. You can't do a complete country lockdown 
certainly in countries which are big like ours and others, and certainly it's also affecting economy. So in being measured in terms of where to influence and implement, stronger measure is a very good thing. However, I want to be sure that it's not just lockdown, that we actually give the resources to prevent the infection. So let me explain to you why. In our country, the big argument is school. You open the school or not open the school, right? So it's affecting children's education, it's affecting family, you name it. So of course schools should be open. However, is it safe? I think what you need to do is to say to the schools, here's the stimulus money, not for economic only, but for the schools to say, you need to upgrade your facility. You need to have, make sure that you have resources to get best possible practice. When you have that, then the lockdown is a lot more effective and you can open much earlier. So to me, it's first good policy, looking at high risk areas, I agree with that. But secondly, providing resources to the community to be able to prepare themselves and to be able to open up again. Hey, we'll take one last question, respecting your time. And I know you have a set another meeting just right after this. Uh, and the last question, I want to summarize it. Uh, I'm, ha I'm trying to understand it myself and summarize it. It's basically it says, you know, this pandemic started in China. However, China seems to be the most successful country at uh, stopping uh, and controlling uh, this matter. Uh, how do you think they achieved that? And second, uh, it says some actions against democracy must have been taken. What is the priority, you, uh, you know, democratic way and uh, people's right to choose uh, or uh, the public health? So it's, it's an interesting no. question, but we deal with it in the U.S. Uh, all the time when somebody says it's my right not to wear a mask. Uh, how do you deal with that? Yeah, so I think when one of our recommendations in GPMB, it really addressed that, is the human dimension. Leadership counts and citizenship counts. But I would say in China, it's taking early decisive action, as other countries have done too, in South Korea and other countries. Early decisive action in closing down Wuhan or Hunan province, in restricting travel and in doing good mask and non-pharmaceutical interventions. So if you contain it early, then of course you're able to do it much better than late action. So my answer would be first early decisive action by government, undertaking good public health measures. But the second issue is what is said, which is citizenship. I think we have to remember we're all protecting each other. So, you know, it's like wearing seatbelt or smoking, right? Seat bell, seat bell law was passed in order to protect each other. You can say infringe on my right. Now the question is, when will we be able to, at the policy level, enable everybody to say, I understand that we have to protect you and protect me. That I think is the essence, Omar, of this whole argument of individual rights. Citizenship counts tremendously. And then I actually think that at the end of the day, uh, behavioral science is important. So at the National Academy, we are using behavioral scientists, social scientists to understand what actually matters to people, what are the ways to incentivize people. So it's not only forcing them to do things, but ways by which you understand how you can influence behavior, enable people to work, act in the same way. Thank you. Thank you so much for a wonderful talk answering all these questions and teaching us what's going on around the world. And hopefully the next time we see you, uh, that you'll be telling us how this pandemic is completely uh, gone and everybody's been uh, vaccinated and we all back to normal life. Uh, so I'm with you all the way. <laughs> thank you very much. And thank you. Up, I will turn it back to you for any uh, additional comments. Okay, thank you very much to Dr. Rao 
for an excellent lecture and hopefully will become a member of the Malta family and we will continue to benefit from his knowledge and wisdom. I want to thank everybody that joined us today, but I'll appreciate very much if you can send us some comments about our Malta conferences on Zoom so we can know how to proceed. I want to remind the members of the Malta family that in December 2021, we will have Malta 10 and we should have a very big celebration. I would like to get comments from you. What would you like to see in Malta 10 and some suggestions how we should proceed? Well, let's pray that we will be able to have a conference face to face. To all our distinguished guests that joined us, I really appreciated you, you coming to our uh, Malta conference and to Holm and Omar and, every, and Nick. Nick deserves a very special thank you. Thank you very much. Hope all of you stay safe and follow the guidelines. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Thank you.